is always there for us your love never ends lord your mercy refreshes us lord thank you so much lord you're a good god lord we thank you lord for who you are but lord we are sinner as well lord may you forgive our sins may you cleanse us may you make us worthy to stand before you to be worthy to live holy before you oh lord lord we come with before your throne of grace today as church, praying and interceding for various concerns. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the successful Thanksgiving Sunday that we could have. Lord, we thank you for enabling us to come together to give thanks to you for your goodness and also, Lord, able to have a good time interacting with one another, able to see each other, Lord, after a long time. We thank you for the beautiful moment. Lord, at this time, we also pray for the coming events. That is the Advent Christmas on the 5th of December. Lord, let this event be a successful one. Lord, I pray, Father, may you prepare our hearts, all the church members, all the leaders, Lord, prepare our hearts so that we can come together, celebrate the joy that you have brought for us lord i pray father for the committee as they plan for the advent christmas lord may you be with them may you strengthen them may their planning organizing be be accountable before your sight oh lord god lord we pray for the working good fellowship that will be that they will be they will held on the first week of december as well Lord, I pray, Father, for the working youths, be with them as well, so that they can come together, they can have a good time fellowshipping in your name, O Lord. O Lord, we also pray for our church members who are not keeping well. Lord, may you be with them. Lord, may you strengthen them. May your healing come to them in time of need, O Lord. Lord, we also remember our church members who were earning for their own livelihood through business, Lord, I pray, Father, for your blessing in, the, in what they do, in their earnings, in their business, that it will prosper, O oh Lord God. I pray, Father, for those who are working. Lord, I pray for security. I pray that they, their work, they will work. They will take their work as their mission place. And Lord, I pray, Father, to provide their needs. And also, Lord, Father, because of the pandemic and the lockdown, 
our church, yes, our church members have gone, gone back home. We are dispersed in different places right now. But Lord, as the time is opening up, Lord, we ask of you to bless the church so that all the church members can come back together in this NCF Pune to worship you, to adore you, to come together as a church, oh Lord God. I pray, Father, for all the leaders, for the students, for the youths, for the families who are away from the city right now. I pray, Father, to protect them and to, to bring them back here safe and sound, O oh Lord God. We thank you, Father, for this time. We surrender all our activities, all the programs into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. Psalm number 1, 11, 2 and 3. Good morning, church. I warmly welcome each one of you to our worship service this morning. And I would also like to thank the worship team and Pastor Dindu for meaningfully leading us into a time of worship and intercessory prayer. This morning, if there is anyone who is worshiping with us for the first time, I kindly request you to stand wherever you are seated. Shall we all look to God in prayer? Merciful God, loving Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us this new day and another beautiful Sunday to worship you in this manner. Lord, we as we come before your presence, we come with our thanksgiving, we come with our offerings and tithes to praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, for blessing us. Lord, bless the offerings, bless the tithes, bless the thanksgiving, and also the giver, Lord Jesus. Bless each and every one of us. Bless all the families of NCF, Lord Jesus. I offer this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Bible passage for this morning meditation is taken from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 26. I'll be reading from NIV. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, will, life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give it exchange for their soul? This is the word of the Lord. This morning, the word of God will be brought to us uh, by Dr. Maisong Dibo Numai. He is the faculty member of Union Biblical Seminary uh, from Theology Department. He is married and blessed with uh, three children. Now we will hear the word of God from him. Over to you, sir. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the time. So, oh, three or four years back, uh, my children thought that I was the best storyteller in the world, but uh, they have changed their mind. They have changed their mind. Uh, I'm not a good storyteller anymore. Uh, for my daughter, who is in class nine, for her, people like Jen Austin, uh, Charles Dickens, or Margaret Mitchell, uh, J.K. Rowling, or like uh, Rick Riordan, and uh, Marcus Zuzek, and uh, 
Isterin Kire, some of them are becoming her best storytellers. And I'm not a sto good storyteller anymore. Some days when my son said that, uh, Papa, your ghost stories are not scary at all. So I have no good answers. So I said, I'm not trying to scare you. <laughs> and uh, that, that is how a storyteller has lost his stories, right? But anyway, uh, storytelling is a very significant dimension in human history. And our Lord Jesus Christ is a supreme storyteller. His stories like parables and the different narratives and the sermons, the preachings are very powerful, inspiring, inspiring us and transforming us till today. And today I stand here as a preacher, as a storyteller, but I believe that the work of the Holy Spirit will guide us so that uh, it's not from me, but it's from the Holy Spirit that we hear the word of God. Let us look to God in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, for today's sermon, I choose a very similar passage and I have entitled my sermon with a uh, similar title, very familiar title, uh, the two chosen scripture which is taken out from Matthew 16, 24 to 26 is read to us and I have entitled my sermon as the cause of discipleship. Let us read another passage from Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 16 to 24. Matthew 19, 16 to 24. The rich young man. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? Where there is no, there is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, give the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all this, what do I still like? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he has many positions. So, uh, the scripture passage is very clear. This passage, this second passage is about a rich young man, which we all know about him, about the story, very familiar. We listen to the story from our childhood. And, uh, you know, this young man came to Jesus Christ and asked, what good things shall I do to enter the kingdom of God, to have eternal life? The question itself asks about what action, what things shall he do to enter the kingdom of God? Then Jesus responds, according to the question, Jesus responds with a kind of answer that is connected to action. And that is the commandments the commandments written in the Old Testament. And when Jesus said, you should do this, that, the young man replied that he had done everything. And he is very perfect according to the Old Testament teachings, according to the Old, Old Testament laws. This young man has done everything righteous and everything that is well and good. And you know, Jesus didn't stop from there. Jesus said, that is enough. No, Jesus didn't say that. He took this person to the other level, to the second level, or to another level. That is the New Testament commandment. And that is to follow him. And to follow him, Jesus met many conditions to this guy. That is to go back home, sell all his belongings, give away all the monies to the poor and come and follow him. And when Jesus brings out this idea, this is the whole commandment of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. If we go by Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, this is about discipleship. 
This is the New Testament commandment for all of us to be the disciples, to be the followers of Jesus Christ. And you know, this young man, when he heard this, he went away weeping, grieving. He went away crying because he cannot compromise with his riches. He chose his wealth and his fortune over Jesus Christ. That is a very, very big mistake he made. We observe that this man made a most kind of deplorable and regrettable response, and there's no, no answer for this, you know? When we, we prioritize riches over Jesus Christ, over the love and the grace of God, I think there is nothing more because we have committed the biggest mistakes in our life. So today, uh, I will just bring out two things, or we will just discuss about two things that hinder us from coming close to Jesus Christ, hinder us from following Jesus Christ. There could be many things, but we would like to discuss two things. Those are money or wealth and pleasure or human desire. You know, these are the two things the most kind of wicked things. But at the same time, we should know that these are the gift of God. These are a blessings for all human beings to live on this earth. But if we misuse it, if we prioritize these two things over Jesus Christ, then we are making a wrong decision. So that will stop us from entering the kingdom of God. You know, this young man is an excellent example of human obsession with riches, with money, with economic prosperity. The, the love for money and wealth had stopped him from becoming the disciple of Jesus Christ. Today, there are millions and millions of people who cannot come to Jesus Christ. They are son, they are hindered because of wealth, because of money and fortune, and they choose those things instead of eternal life and the second thing for us is pleasure you know pleasure very important in our life it's a blessing from god but if we misuse it it spoils and it destroys our whole life you know this is connected to our desire adultery pride self-satisfaction substance addiction sexual perverseness extreme individualism, self-centeredness, narcissism, and all these things are connected to pleasure and desire. You know, worldly desires, carnal sin, and satisfaction are all about, about pleasure, and, and these things cannot come together with us if we want to follow Jesus Christ. So, you know, if the information is correct, then one of the greatest apologists of the 20th and the 21st century, Ravi Zekaria, falls into this pit. I'm not so sure whether the information is right or wrong, but as much as the information is there in the market, Ravi Zekaria has made big mistakes because he was a man of pervert pleasure, self-seeking desire, extramarital affair, fornication, and he destroyed many women in his life, in his ministry. So this is an example of becoming a slave of pleasure instead of becoming the slave of God. This is the region where and pleasure cannot, can stop us from following Jesus Christ and face spiritual collapse in our lives. We Christians need to be very, very careful, you know? I'll just bring a one example uh, from the novel, the, the Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I think uh, many of you might have read or watched the movie, and that's one of my favorite movie, The Lord of the Rings. And in that story, there's a very, very uh, interesting character. His name is called Smigol. And this Smigol is a hobbit, a very short guy from a small, short community, from a hobbit community. And he was a good man. 
But one day, his brother, cousin, got a ring, got a ring from the river. And when he, the, his cousin got a ring, he, he wanted, this Migol wanted to get the ring. So what did he do? He killed, he murdered his cousin, and he got a ring for him. And this is not an ordinary ring. This ring is filled with power, and the power is evil. The power is full of corrupt. And the ring has possessed him. The ring has overtaken him, completely destroyed him, and even transformed his physical body that he became like a kind of things which we, we uh, totally different from the hobbits and totally different from the humans. And if you have watched the movie or read the stories, you might have come across that. And you know, this guy, Golam, his other name is called Golam. He was fully possessed by the evil ring that he could not come out from it. And his whole life, at one point of time, he lost the ring. He tried to get back the ring and he was searching for the ring. And at the end of the story, he got back the ring, but that was the end of himself, of him and the ring. Both of them, they, they were destroyed by the fire. When he tried to save the ring, he and the ring went inside the fire and both of them were destroyed. A very good example of how one is obsessed with anything apart from God. If we are taken away by anything and not God, then we will be completely destroyed like this guy, Golam, or his name, other name is Mikol, or this young man that we have seen. That is a dangerous situation for all of us, you know? So uh, with that in mind, we'll come back to the first scripture passage from Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26, where it talks about following Jesus Christ. Here, Jesus gives us two conditions to follow Jesus Christ. One is to deny ourselves, and the other one is to take up the cross. So how do we deny ourselves, and how do we take up the cross? Two challenges for all of us. So when we are asked to deny ourselves, we are asked to renounce our right to our life. We think that our life is ours, but God asks us to know that our life is not ours, it is from God. So when we are asked to deny ourselves, we have to renounce our right to life, to our life, giving up, giving up, everything that is not according to the will of God and making a decisive life-altering choices, turning away from our self-centeredness and sins. That, those things are very important when we talk about denying ourselves. And the second point, how do we carry the cross? There are two understandings. The first understanding is during the time of Jesus Christ in, in the the kind of uh, 300 years between the Roman Empire and Jesus Christ, where the understanding of cross is very different from today's understanding. In the time of Jesus Christ, the understanding of cross is something very embarrassing, very humiliating. And, you know, that is a kind of uh, understanding when they talk about the cross. Going back to the history of Israel's, the Israelites, you know, uh, they were the most rebellious people in the world against uh, Roman Empire. And what did they do? They always rebel. So every day it's a, it's a kind of uh, images where so many Jews, rebellious Jews, will be crucified on the cross and they will be put on the highways so that everybody can see. The Roman Empire was trying to depict that any forces trying to go against the empire will be crucified like that. So they put all the cross on the highways. So when we talk about the cross, 
in time of Jesus Christ, it was despicable, it was the worst thing, a cruel and a very disgraceful thing, which humiliates everybody. But the understanding, the second understanding of the cross after Jesus Christ is totally different. It is about love. Today we see the cross in every church. It's about love. It's about forgiveness. It's about repentance. It's about grace. And it's about sacrifice, saving our sins, or saving ourselves, saving us from the sins. It's what symbolizes today. And you know, in the medieval world, in the medieval period, the church are built so high. All the Gothic churches are very tall. And I hope it's there in Pune also. I'm not so sure. I'm quite new to Pune. So uh, you guys will be familiar with Pune, how the churches are built. But there are many churches built in line with Gothic style, right? Gothic style. And they are very tall. And what does the cross, that tall cross above the church signifies? In the medieval time, you may be anywhere in the farm, in the borders, far away. Still, you will look back to your town and you will see the cross. That means you might be full of tiresome. You might be in a painful situation. You are in a situation where you face lots of problems. But still, when you look at the cross, you feel joy, you feel happiness, you feel blessings, you feel the love of God. That's the reason they build the Gothic churches very tall and they are standing till today all over the world. And today I think uh, the fashion has not lost. Many of the churches are built uh, with that design till today. And that's the reason the cross has signified today for us. So how do we carry the cross? And you know, when this cross narrative to carry the cross is not a free right. It's not so simple. It takes many things to follow Jesus Christ. We are to lose ourselves in verse 25. Die to self, deny everything that we are, not in parcel ways, but and it is not optional for us. It is a full commitment, holistic, and it is from our self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. So following Jesus Christ is not very simple, you know. That is the reason there's a pastor of, there was a pastor in Germany during the time of Second World War. His name was, uh, his name is called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he talks about two types of grace. Two types of grace, cheap grace and costly grace that we Christians, we perceive or we understand. Many of our Christians, we are Christians, we follow Jesus Christ, but we wanted to have the cheap grace that is following Jesus Christ without persecution, without suffering, without facing any trials and temptations. We just want to have a ticket to go to heaven or not to go to hell. That is what Bonhoeffer talks about, cheap grace. But he talks about another grace which is very costly. That is called the costly grace. And this costly grace is very, very costly. It costs even God, his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And this costly grace challenges us to face persecutions, sufferings, and all the trials and temptations with the power of God. Just as like Peter, who faced all the challenges, like Bonhoeffer, who died while standing against Hitler and his regime, and he was hanged because he tried to assassinate Hitler, and he, their plans fell, but but he knew that killing Hitler is very important at that point of time. Actually, he was a pacifist, but he became a man who stood 
to assassinate Hitler because instead of killing millions and millions of people and the war will be stopped. So to stop the war, he and the other guys, they planned to assassinate Hitler. The plan was fell and at last he was captured and killed. But he stood for righteousness and he stood for justice and he became a Christian martyr. So, you know, when we talk about carrying our cross, the cross is very costly. And when we talk about grace, God's grace is not very simple. It demands his only son to die on the cross for all of us. So today, you know, for us to follow Jesus Christ, there are so many challenges. Well can betray us, well can cheat us, or our fortunes, riches, money can trick us. Evil desires and self-seeking pleasures can destroy us. And moreover, this edge is an edge of self-obsession, you know, an edge of narcissism, an edge of selfie. Selfies, I think everybody takes, but an obsessed selfie is also there, where no selfie, no life, type of life is there in this world today. Humans are becoming more and more self-centered, filled with egos, money, addiction, pleasure, and many elements have made us more and more selfish, egoistic, big head, only me attitude, and extremely individualistic. And you know, this generation, deep down inside, we are very narcissistic. We love only ourselves, and we don't care much about others. We have no empathy and sympathy for others. And we are challenged by the word of God today again, just as it was challenged to that young man during his time. To rethink of our life, what exactly we are. Are we losing our life for God's sake? And are we standing for the cross? There's a challenge for all of us. We should always keep in our mind that losing our life is much, much bigger than gaining the whole world. So, you know, many of us can think that we can do anything today and we can choose Jesus Christ. We can choose to follow Jesus Christ only when we, can, when we grow old. But the scripture tells us that choosing Jesus Christ is decisive. It is a radical choice. And just as the young man who didn't get another chance, even for us to follow Jesus Christ, we may not get another chance. And even after following Jesus Christ, becoming the disciples of Jesus Christ, we may still lose our discipleship if we end up prioritizing wealth, money, and pleasure instead of Jesus Christ. So we need to be very careful. So now is the time of apocalypse. Now is the time of salvation. Today, right now, is the time of salvation for all of us once again. And it is the time of decision making that as long as we live, our priority is Jesus Christ, not anything in this world. Even though we need many things, still then, all these things are just part of our life. The most top priority for us is Jesus Christ. Just as this young man who missed to become the 13th disciple of Jesus Christ, when Jesus called him, he didn't call him to test him. Jesus has lots of concern for him. He loved him and he called him, but he didn't come. He didn't follow Jesus Christ. So it's a challenge for us that 
following Jesus Christ is a decisive moment for all of us. The scripture reminds us today that following Jesus Christ is costly. We have to give up many things we like and we love in our life. It is a radical discipleship, very challenging. Carrying our cross is, a, is the only choice, but the end is amazingly great. As humans, as Christians living in this world, we need money. We have human physical desires but don't let these things carry us away from the love of Christ. Let us humbly come back to Jesus, our Savior, resubmit ourselves to him and follow him even to the point of death. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you so much for the grace that you have given to each and every one of us. It's all because of your grace that we can follow you. We have no power, no strength, and no knowledge, but we depend completely on you. And today, this moment, you have challenged us once again to recheck our discipleship, to think and rethink about our fellowship with you. Lord God, continue to take care of us and let your will be done in everything of our life. We want to thank you and we want to bless your name. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Maisong, for reminding us uh, with the word of God. <coughs> in fact, if there is anything that hinders us from enjoying healthy relationship with God, from following Jesus Christ meaningfully, we must, we must uh, surrender, we must give up. Thank you and God bless you. And I also want to say thank you to all the participants, beginning from our leader, our worship leaders, all of you, we are blessed. May God continue to <coughs> bless you and use you even in the days to come. Shall we all unite our hearts and receive the benediction? Now, may the love of God our Father, the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Church, we have a few announcements, but very important. Please uh, listen carefully and also uh, communicate to our friends, our members who are not here, and if uh, especially uh, those who are not even uh, joining online, because we understand that uh, there are many of our friends who are not well because of, because of the change of weather. So please, uh, uh, convey this message or communicate this uh, uh, information. Number one, we have uh, Advent Christmas uh, coming soon. It will be on 5th of December, that is on Sunday. And the venue is this, the same, the venue will remain the same, but the timing, please take note of this, the timing, the leaders are considering uh, to uh, have this special program on the, I mean, at 5 p.m., 5 to 6.30. So please keep this in mind. And uh, yeah, traditional way of celebrating this uh, uh, pre-Christmas, we used to call it Gendada. But this year, it is not possible because we do not have a main power for many things and especially the choir. So we will come up with a special, still the program will be special, at one Christmas uh, celebration will be a very special one. So please give this, it, give this in mind, 5th of December at 5 p.m. Uh, here in UBS uh, Conference Hall. The second one is uh, yeah, our brother and our associate pastor, Dindu, will be traveling back home for um, 
his brother's wedding, which is on 9th of December. Please keep his brother's wedding uh, in uh, your prayers. Let us keep in our prayers and especially his travel on uh, 23rd. So uh, remember this and keep this in your personal prayers as well, especially for the success of this, uh, his brother's wedding on the 9th of December. The third one is about the co-leaders meeting tonight. Please keep us in your prayers. Uh, we have maybe around six o'clock, we have a co-leaders meeting, which happens every month. Okay, monthly uh, co-leaders meeting. So please keep this in mind and then pray for us as well. We have, uh, again, I just want, I'm, I'm glad to announce you that our sisters in Christ, uh, Manon and Kei, they are back to the city. Uh, Kei already led us in singing the hymn while offerings were collected. So uh, welcome back, Kei and Manon, and we are happy to see you. And uh, our some of our members also traveled, and one I remember is uh, our brother, Joshua Tanami, the pastoral team member. He went to Goa and he's back here. We'll come back. And of course, before Deborah and Nishida and all went and they are back to the city. Thank you. Thank you. And then sorry for not informing earlier. I hope you enjoyed. So welcome back all of you. And then now may I call upon Sister Deborah for the blessing song, please. Before we sing the blessing song, I would like to ask if anybody's having birthdays, anniversaries. Well, there's being a birthday today is our brother uh, Ashish has a niece. She was born two hours ago. So we are happy and rejoicing of new life coming. Uh, to our, our hearts. So uh, if there's no one anniversaries, uh, anybody going out, leaving the living town? Okay, we can, oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> uh, let's stand up, let's raise our hands, face each other, this uh, column with this other, and please, with a generous heart, bless, bless one another with a blessing song. Next one.